This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 5255 South Linden Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Our subject today is a plan for protection. Our scripture reading is from Ruth chapter three, verses one through five, and chapter four, verses 13 through, four, through 17. And it reads, Naomi, her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now, here is our kinsman, Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the thrashing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when they came together, the Lord made her conceive and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a next of kin and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her breast and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi and they named him Obed and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Hello, my name is Ruth and I'd like to share my story. I was born in the land of Moab to two loving parents. However, when I was young, my father died, leaving my mother a widow. Other than being fatherless, I had what I believe was a normal childhood. We worship Chemosh, the fish god, whose name means destroyer or subduer. As a child, I always wondered if the destroyer god would ask the priest to sacrifice me for the sins of my parents, my family, my clan, or my country. When I was a teenager, I met a young man named Melan. He was very kind, but came from a different nation and culture. Although I was reluctant to marry a foreigner, the day came when I said yes. I learned that his deceased father, Elimelech, and his mother, Naomi, had immigrated to Moab from Israel. 
there, there had been a famine in their land and they had come to make a life in my country. I suppose they stayed because his father died. I learned so much from Melon and my mother-in-law. Many of the things they taught me were different from what I had learned as a child. For example, I learned the family unit is the central aspect of Israel's culture. We are a part of the ancestral house of Israel, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the Hebrew. They are our people. We're also a part of the family of Judah, son of Israel. That is our tribe. And we are part of the family of Perez. That is our clan. Our identity is the household of Elimelech of Bethlehem. When married, women move to their husband's household and basically give up their old family identity. I also learned from them that all humans, males and females, are made in the image of God and deserve dignity and respect. They said their people had been slaves in Egypt and they were not allowed to treat any fellow human, even if they were a widow or an orphan or a stranger with disrespect. They said that they were to provide for widows and orphans not because the king commanded it, but their God commanded it. Caring for the disadvantaged, especially those without male or financial support, is written into the law of their country. Israel is so instructed to offer the third year's produce given especially so that the immigrants, the orphans, and the widows who live in their cities will come and feast until they are filled. Do this, they taught me, that the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. We are also directed to leave some grain in the field so that the immigrant and the orphan and the widow can have some means of support by gleaning from the remains left behind by the harvesters. My mother-in-law, Naomi, likes to tell of her ancestors' family. It seems that Judah, the head of our tribe, married and had three sons. He chose a wife for his oldest son, but he died with no children. Because of this, there was a rule in Israel that the brother or the next male kin was to marry the widow and have children for the dead husband so that his name and his inheritance would be preserved in Israel. So Judah gave his second son to the widow to have children in place of his brother, but the brother would not perform the duty to his deceased brother. And he died too. The father promised his third son to the widow to marry her, but he reneged on the agreement. I think it was something about he was scared that the third son might die too. Well, when the widow realized that she would not marry the third son, she disguised herself and figured out how her and tricked her father-in-law into impregnating her, the child of this union became the head of our clan. 
I had been married to Malon for quite some time when the unthinkable happened. After years, both my husband and my brother-in-law died. We were widows, Naomi, Orpha, and I. We had no male protectors, no fathers, no husbands, no brothers, and no uncles to protect us. And Naomi announced that she was returning to Bethlehem in Judah, where food was available. Naomi urged us to return to our families since she was too old to have sons for us to marry. Orpah stayed in Moab. But I insisted that I would not abandon Naomi despite an uncertain future in Judah. I told her that she and I were now family. And because of this, I accepted her God and her people, whatever that would bring. So we journeyed to Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, it was the time of the barley harvest. And I asked Naomi if I, a widow, but also a foreigner, would be allowed to glean in the fields of the farmers, the farmers. So I went into the field to glean ears of grain for food after the harvesters as the law permitted the widows. I met the owner of the field. His name was Boaz, a very nice man who blessed me by saying, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your family and your hometown land and came to live with the people that you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I believed then that the Lord had given me a homeland, a new homeland, and blessed me for following my mother-in-law. So I said to Boaz, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of even one of your servant girls. Boaz gave me great hospitality. He made sure I had food when it was lunchtime with him and his servants. He made sure that I had water as I worked. And he, he was so generous that I even had leftovers to share with Naomi when I would go home. And then he asked me, to continue in his fields throughout the various harvests. And he instructed his young men to protect me. He is a gracious man and he was kind to me. I think because of my concern for Naomi and he treated me with great kindness. When I got home, and Naomi heard of Boaz and his kindness. She told me that he was our next of kin, our redeemer. Sort of reminded me a little bit of Judah, but I was hoping it would be a different kind of story. At the end of the barley harvest, Naomi made plans for our long-term protection. She instructed me to go to the harvest festival that night, wait until Boaz had feasted and gone to sleep, 
and uncover the feet of Boaz as he was sleeping on the threshing floor. So according to her instructions, I washed, anointed myself with perfume and put on my very best gown. And quietly, I went to the threshing floor as Naomi had instructed me. In the middle of the night, Boaz found me at his feet and he said, who are you? And I answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid for you are my close relative. Naomi had explained to me that spread your mantle is used by God, her God, and now my God, while establishing a covenant with Israel. And here she explained, the phrase would be understood by Boaz as a proposal of marriage. So Boaz told me that he was indeed willing to marry me, but there was another male relative even closer. He sent me home to Naomi with enough grain to feed us and even more to sell for our other needs. Naomi said that we would know that day whether Boaz or the other relative would marry me. Boaz, according to the story that I heard later, found the other male relative and in the presence of the elders of, the, of Bethlehem, explained that Naomi needed to sell the land of her late husband, Elimelech. The male relative said that he'd be glad to purchase the land. Then Boaz explained that the one who purchased also had the responsibility of marrying the widow, widow of Malon and caring for the widow of Elimelech. The male relative said that he could not accept financial responsibility for the two women and gave up his lawful claim to marry me. Boaz then declared his intention to marry me to the elders of the city. Unlike Naomi's story of Judah and Tamar, his daughter-in-law, who tricked him, my marriage was blessed as Naomi and I joined the house of Boaz, a generous and faithful Israelite man. The elders then offered a prayer that ended with the offspring that the Lord will give to you by this young woman. May your house become like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Well, the rest is history, they say. Boaz and I were married and had a son, Obed. And his name means servant of God. His son is Jesse, the father of eight strong and handsome young men and two intelligent and loving daughters. His youngest child, David, is kind and has a tender, loving and forgiving heart. Our story is one not absent of struggle, but we learn through the struggle to support one another. We survived in the face of death and the threat of hunger, but we always believed that God was working on our behalf. 
Now, I don't know what the future will hold, but the God of Israel has blessed Naomi and me with great joy. God has given us a home and a people. God has given me a wonderful mother-in-law who had a plan for our protection. God has given me a wonderful husband. God has taken us under his wings of protection, provision, and love. We went from being widows who were destitute, marginalized, and unprotected to women provided for, protected, and loved. Not only did God use Boaz to protect us, now we have a son, a grandson, and eight great-grandsons. We will never be without a protector. And now I laugh because Naomi has said that if God used Tamar to bless the people of Israel by being the mother of the head of our clan, who knows what God may do for our descendants. I laugh because I'm a foreigner, an immigrant, a former widow. Yes, I honored my obligation to care for my widowed mother-in-law, Naomi. And now I look forward to more blessings and more joy under the protection of our God. I wonder, how will God use our family to bless our people? Who knows what God has in store? I just know that God is working on our behalf to protect us. Thanks be unto God. And thank you for listening to my story. My brothers and sisters believe the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that Ruth became the great grandmother of King David. And the scripture tells us that Jesus the Christ was a descendant of the King David. It's amazing how God can work things out beyond our wildest imagination. And he invites each of us to confess faith in Christ and be baptized into his church. This gives us new life and makes us members of the family of God. So accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for providing a way of faith and salvation. It's not important what family we were born into. It's not important about our nationality or our culture or our education, but you have given us a way to become your children and given us your protection, your love and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the power of that good news. Thank you for inviting us to be in partnership with you in your family, 
in your mission, in your ministry. Lord, we thank you for equipping us through your Holy Spirit. Sometimes, Lord, we think we have nothing to give, and yet you honor us with the dignity and respect and say to us that we are made in your image. Lord, we thank you. We ask you, Lord, to teach us to trust in you more and more each day. Lord, we ask you, like you taught Naomi and Ruth, to trust and depend on you. Lord, as they did, teach us to show love and concern for others in the things that we say and do. Lord, we know that you are the protector. You are the guider. You are the forgiver. We ask that you replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with health and healing. Replace our sadness and our anxiety with your joy and your peace and your hope. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, be a Ruth to those around you. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen and amen.